Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Blair Taylor, the director of and also an instructor with the Institute for Social Ecology based in Vermont, which was founded by Murray Bookchin, or at least co-founded by Murray Bookchin. The ISC recently ran an introduction to social ecology course, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and it's kind of deepened my understanding of um, history of protest and revolution and given me some practical ideas as well for organizing, which I hope I will be able to put into practice. Um, Blair has a PhD in political science from the New School for Social Research based in New York. He specialized in political theory and American politics. Blair is a prol prolific scholar, author, and activist. He has received many scholarships and awards. Um, and his political writings have been published in many journals and anthologies. He has also held various teaching positions in America and also in Europe, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, most notably for the purposes of today's chat, I'd just like to particularly mention this book, um, The Next Revolution, uh, collected some collected essays of Murray Bookchin, which Blair co-edited and also co-wrote the introduction to um, it's really good. This is this is the main my sort of main reference for Bookchin's work. Actually, I haven't read much else apart from some of the suggested texts on the course. Um, yeah, Blair has had many experience, um, many years of experience with organising as well, practical organising, including against the WTO in Seattle, which I'd like to talk about in a bit, and being involved with the Occupy movement. And he currently organises with the West Sound Democratic. Socialists of America. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, thanks for having me. Great pleasure. Um, first of all, I'd just like to ask quite a simple or ostensibly simple question of uh, how you first arrived at social ecology and, uh, and communalism from a general academic background in politics, or was it through was it through a more academic background or through your practical experience of activism and organizing that you first came to Bookchin's ideas and ideas around social ecology? Um, I got to radical politics more just through my own experience and then, you know, found social ecology uh, later. But essentially, I mean, I got politicized through, um, you know, the, the punk rock scene and hardcore okay. scene. It was very politicized and my own experience of you know, just um, fighting neo-Nazis in the music scene, uh, being a skateboarder, coming into daily conflict with uh, cops and private property that, you know, okay. funneled me toward punk rock, punk rock to Noam Chomsky, anarchism, et cetera. But it was in college that I, um, I had an environmental politics professor. I was also very involved and inspired by at that moment in the late 90s, the Earth First movement. You know, I lived oh, yeah. in Washington state, the Evergreen state, and we had a lot of forest defense here. Oh, yeah. And so... Um, I was a big fan of that, and I was a vegetarian, um, still am, so the critique of anthropocentrism was a big part of that. Anyway, I had this professor who um, mentioned the book Defending the Earth, the debate between Dave Foreman of Earth First and Murray Bookchin, and I read it, and I was like blown away. He just demolishes all these ideas, and I, I really agreed with him, and then I looked at some other books, more, more some of his polemical works, like um, Social versus Lifestyle Anarchism, which I was very engaged in the anarchist movement, and those resonated uh, very much with my critiques, I guess, of the kind of anarchist and like activist milieu. So uh, I saved up some money and uh, in the summer of 2000, which was just after the Seattle WTO demonstrations, which I spent like a year organizing around, um, I went out to the Institute for Social Ecology for the month long when we had a physical campus in Vermont, which we no longer do. Um, and we, we did a month long uh, course, summer school really called Ecology and Community, which was just like 60 people from around the globe really spending you know 12 hours a day talking about radical politics radical theory and swimming in ponds and wow. hanging out and listening to lectures with Murray Bookchin and it was really a fantastic transformative experience and sure. really became a political and intellectual home and I have just kept coming back ever since and then joined the board and started teaching and got hired in 2016 um, to roll out the online courses um, and I yeah that's my function now I'm, I'm the program director for the ISC yeah amazing okay fantastic um, there was a lot in there. That's amazing. Um, okay, so we learned on the intro course uh, that Bookchin's communalism, or, or maybe you could say his version of libertarian socialism, is a kind of synthesis of elements of both anarchist and communist thought or praxis. Um, I wonder if you could kind of 
humor me and 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 uh, kind of put your teaching hat on for a minute and explain it's more for the audience's benefit um, why communalism is not simply anarchism and or or and is also not status communism. Um, is there a simple, concise way of explaining how communalism doctrines, communalism differs from both anarchism and communism? Um, perhaps with reference to his own back, uh, his own history in those traditions, um, is there a kind of quite a simple way of or concise way of explaining that? Do you think, like imagining that you have an audience of perhaps communists and and, and anarchists, can it be said in quite a polite sort of way? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think those were really the, the traditions and the audiences that Murray was trying to speak to. He was, he was okay. very concerned with trying to create a new kind of um, politics of the left that really built on the insights of those two, you know, the main two traditions of the radical left, Marxism and anarchism, but also transcending them. So I would say, you know, from the Marxist tradition, which he spent, you know, a good chunk of his life in until the 1940s was a um, you know, a red diaper baby, grew up in the socialist milieu of New York City, and then basically broke with it over Stalinism and the increasingly obvious authoritarianism on the one hand, and also his own um, disillusionment with the labor movement. He was a labor organizer, uh, I believe in the 40s, and basically he saw that the, the, the working class, the industrial working class, was not becoming more and more in conflict with capitalism, but was becoming more and more integrated into it and less critical of it. So he started looking for different energies. So from the 40s, 50s on, he started working within the kind of anarchist tradition as something he thought might offer some different, um, you know, theoretical, conceptual, political tools. And he identified as an anarchist until the late 90s, from the 50s to the late 90s. So from there, he really um, drew on this ethical critique of capitalism, not just like a economistic critique that he thought, you know, was was kind of central to the Marxian vision that, you know, we're not just all going to get ground down into dust by capitalism and almost automatically, scientifically, objectively become radicalized and see our objective interest in overthrowing it. There was too many mediating factors he thought Marx left out as much as he had a lot of respect for that. So he was trying to um, avoid the authoritarianism of, of the Marxist and communist left while while well, accepting much of its um, critical analysis of the problems of capitalism, just not of how it was going to go away. Yeah. And then the anarchist respect for you know, um, individual subjectivity, for freedom, um, critique of the state, et cetera, as like an appendage of the, the ruling class. So he wanted to um, supplement these though with what he thought was the, the, the lost treasure of the revolutionary tradition to use Hannah Arendt's words, um, that they had both kind of not spent enough time looking at the forms of freedom, which is a very strong through line through his work going back to the 1960s, which put him in conflict with both anarchists and Marxists. He really wanted to inject a, a, a ethos of direct democracy into the radical left and not just an ethos, but he really saw it as the institutional form the radical left had been missing was staring it in the face going back all the way to 1871. And I'm wearing my Paris oh, wow. Commune sweatshirt today. It was uh, the 150th anniversary last week, which happens to also be my birthday. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, he really thought that this, this, this council popular assembly form where people came together, deliberated and made decisions to, uh, to run society themselves in an unmediated way and in an anti-capitalist way was really something that was missed by Marxists in favor of their dictatorship of the proletariat and anarchists with their distrust of democracy, of institutional forms and their kind of valorization of the individual. So communalism really is a, it's an anti-capitalist directly democratic politics that seeks to empower people uh, by transforming politics from something that is done to them by politicians, elites, and the state to something they do themselves, which just means essentially, um, you know, controlling the world around them, having an input into it. Um, so it's it's a different orientation towards politics, I would say. Yeah, great, thanks a lot for that. Um, so moving on to your uh, some of your activism and uh, organizing. Um, so my history is not great so it, it, it will get better but so seattle 1999 um the anti anti-world trade organization protest movement if you can call it that um from your perspective what happened and what victories were achieved by activists organizers if any um and and what was your involvement uh, in that movement and how did book chin's ideas inform what was going on for you 
Yeah, so that was really, in many ways, my political kind of awakening or coming of age. I mean, I'd, I'd been politically active before that and in college right. with a variety of different movements. Yeah. But, you know, famously, this movement was a movement of movements. It was a moment that provided kind of a, um, a focal point for people involved in the labor movement, the environmental movement, the feminist movement. All these movements came together and were unified in this critique of the kind of unfettered global capitalism that the WTO represented. And of course, we were also trailing behind and inspired by the Zapatista uprising against NAFTA in 1994. Okay. And 30, 40 years prior to that, of you know movements in the global south that were fighting against the structural adjustment programs of the IMF and World Bank. They were fighting, you know, neoliberal global capitalism. Yeah. And then it got closer and closer to home. And you know, so Seattle was very deeply and directly inspired by um, those movements in the global south. And in fact, they were there in the streets with us. So this also grew out of you know um, I don't know quite a few years of. Um, direct action activism in North America that was especially the radical environmental movement, um, direct action labor orientation, a lot of IWW, industrial workers of the world, people, femin feminist and eco-feminist movements, a whole lot of different movements who a lot of us knew each other from working on these campaigns, um, you know, in a pre-internet age and, and kind of learning direct action and learning a form of direct democracy that was rooted in that. So the Direct Action Network was the main organization that organized this shutdown in Seattle. And uh, it became really an, an important node of a kind of prefigurative politics that, you know, we used consensus decision making, which me and Murray had our own critiques of and others did. Um, but we're really trying to, uh, you know, put forth an anti-capitalist direct directly democratic and ecological um, politics, which here's, here's the irony to bring back to social ecologies. This was very, very close to the politics that Murray had been arguing for since the 1960s. Okay. Direct democracy, check. Critique of capitalism, check. Ecological component, check. And yet at that same moment, he was in the midst of very fierce polemics with um, a lot of kind of the, the dominant anarchist writers of his day. Yeah. And was basically in the process of rejecting anarchism, even as a lot of activists, the, the main core of activists, were, were embracing a politics very close to his own. So it's kind of like ships in the night. Um, he abandoned anarchism. And in, you know, in the last chapter of the next revolution, he even has some commentary that's fairly critical of the movement. Um, and I think those, those are um, you know, valid criticisms to make. But on the other hand, he was quite old and infirm at that point. He couldn't really be engaged. And for me, this was like a very exciting, important, inspiring moment because an anti-capitalist politics was back on the table. And it was, it was putting the words capitalism and neoliberalism into the public eye in a way that had been gone, hadn't been there at all in my you know, entire lifetime, essentially. Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I've taken that on board. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna really enjoy watching this back and, and uh, go researching more and, and looking for more references and so on. My next question- I wrote, was, I wrote my dissertation on that, on the, the kind of alter globalization movement and its recuperation. Okay. And so I also have my own critiques of it and how it also led into Occupy and yeah, um, yeah. You know, we can get into that later or you know, follow I'll, up. I'll, I'll give a read, I'll give it, I'll definitely have a read of that um, if that's possible. Um, so yeah, my next question was going to be more about uh, the neoliberal agenda and how WTO, IMF, World Bank, as you've already uh, brought up since the 80s at least, um, dominated by the, uh, um, the ideology of the Sh Chicago School of Ec Economics has pushed neoliberal capitalism on, on the globe as a whole, um, as, uh, with, as many would argue, worsening consequences for environmental and social justice. So in that context, to what extent, and I know you, you touched on this in your writings or more than touched on it, and we'll go into that a bit further later, but just to bring up initially this, this idea of um, building international organizations to counter the power of, of these powerful economic institutions of, of, of neoliberalism, the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera. Um, I know you talk about building Broad, co broad coalitions on the left. But my question is gonna be, do we also need to build um, organizations which go into the middle, go into the middle ground or even, or even kind of moderate right conservative in order to defeat this beast of neoliberalism? Do we not need to find opposition wherever we can and not, not sell out on our ideas, but somehow, whether it's by a kind of uh, transitional demands or, 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 or whatever, can, can we find some kind of agreements in, in organizations 
um, even even yeah, obviously never not the far right, and there's a lot of warning against the far right in in the intro to social ecology course, which I totally take on board, and of course I'm completely anti-fascist, but do we not need to make a distinction between fascists and moderate conservatives specifically to build coalitions against neoliberalism? Is that possible, or am I being how naive am I being when I say that when I ask that? Well, I don't know. On the one hand, I think that, you know, there's a social protectionist impulse in, in some, you know, right and um, conservative movements that they see the erosion, the, the destructive flux of capitalism. And yeah. there's, of course, there's a long tradition of conservative critics of, of capitalism. Yeah. The problem is that most of those analyses point to the, the answer they point to is even more problematic than capitalism. Than they yeah. For example, for Catholic conservatives, you know, they want the patriarchal family to be protected from the ravages of capitalism. So they want to go back to the social wage of the 1930s and 40s, where you could have the patriarchal head of household. Or they, they think that, you know, the, the global capitalism is eroding, you know, white Western culture and civilization. So we need to protect this culture against et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Marx saw all this, you know, very clearly in the Communist Manifesto even, where he writes about you know, capitalism battering down all uh, walls of cultural isolationism and having this kind of progressive force. So I think the, the, the problem there is we don't want a politics that's looking nostalgically backwards because no. you know, we, want, we want an intersectional analysis of domination and hierarchy that doesn't trade the ravages of capitalism for racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now that said, I think it's not difficult to win them over to um, a politics that is about, you know, creating a world in common where we can make the decisions that impact our lives, where we're not, um, you know, degraded every single day by busy work and toil that, you know, yeah. takes our time away from our families, from our communities. And I think these are, these are elements that speak to people, you know, that transcend uh, political ideology. But I think that it also means sharpening that to a point so that they see capitalism is what makes those things impossible um, in addition to other interlocking systems of, of domination. So there's a longer history of this with, you know, left movements breaking right and uh, the kind of like left, uh, left, right overlap, queer fronts, uh, third way politics has, has, a, has a kind of a dangerous pedigree, but I think yeah. we absolutely can and must win those people over. And I think, you know, just, just looking here in the United States, I think Look at some looking at some of the crossover appeal that even like a, a moderate social democrat like Bernie Sanders had um, is telling. You know, when you start talking about bread and butter issues of having healthcare, having housing, having a livable wage, things like that, yeah. it's obviously not like you know the end of capitalism as we know it, but it's opening up space where maybe you know more radical questions can be posed. I would say. So I think you know th these are two old New York radical left Jews from from Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, they famously even had a debate, you know, in the I think 80s, um, you know, kind of a classic statist versus non-statist approach. Um, so they knew of each other. And actually, my co-editor, Debbie Bookchin, worked for Bernie Sanders for many years. So there's oh, a funny okay. twining. I mean, it's a small state. But I think there's a complementarity to them as well, that there's, there's a lot of um, overlap and that one can open the door to the more libertarian socialist uh, ideas and aspirations of the other. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I had some 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 more to ask around that. It's, it, it's something that perplexes me, the the whole right left wing uh, um, thing, and how um, to what extent to what extent it is the right left. I mean, obviously, I understand to some extent there is a real left wing, uh, and there's a real right wing, but but also I wonder to what extent the media. And neoliberalism itself perpetuates this, these kind of divided camps, where, where in ways that they're not always divided, and and particularly when you have these kind of um, strat stratifications through society of 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 um, of everything. I, I'm not explaining myself very well. What, what I'm trying to get. No, I, I take your point. Like the divisions that you know, what are the most important divisions and. At least that's how I'm hearing it. And, um, you know, are we being unnecessarily divided? And yeah. again, I think it, it really goes back to your analysis of the problems. And this is something that the Institute really has always focused on um, and been, you know, very, very attentive to is that different, this is why analysis matters because your different analysis will point you in different directions. So in this regard, you know, if we go back to the radical environmental movement that I kind of came up in, it's not accidental that Dave Foreman's analysis of the nature of the problem of humans in general being this voracious 
over consuming, over populating species led to him directly, in my view, taking, you know, very nasty racist positions against immigration, um, you know, praising HIV for thinning out the human population, really, really nasty anti-human population. There's a direct link there. In the same way, you know, I think like a fascist critique of capitalism, they, they have it, um, points in, you know, reactionary, problematic, anti-modernist and racist uh, directions as well. So yeah. I think some of those, those things do matter. Um, I think we have to, you know, look at how we can win that debate uh, and win people over our camp. And also through, through the actual things that we do, through our actual uh, counter institutions that we organize, this is that prefigurative component, which in some ways that, that word of prefigurative politics, where we kind of show the world we want uh, by how we organize and do things in the here and now. Um, there's good versions of that and bad versions of that, but I would say that, you know, to the extent to which that we can meet each other's needs, that we can create a cooperative economy, that we can um, do other forms of, of uh, alternative institutions, can really win people over that be outside of ideological, uh, uh, ideological concerns, right? It's not just everyone's going to have to read this book and agree with every line of da 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 da. That's not the vision of social change. But I will say that those ideas matter in terms of. Um, where we're going and how we get there. And I think yeah. that was a lot of Bookchin's concern was that, you know, um, some of the, the real disastrous endpoints of, um, you know, communism in the last century were very clearly there from, from the theory as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was going to add that, that in, in, you know, potentially uh, on a more positive note, I guess, the, 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 the ideal sort of communalist society in that society where everything is decided locally and then confederated upwards potentially it, it would surely end up you'd surely end up with less extreme divisions of, of of opinion between people over the long term surely there would be a more groundedness in people's views on well potentially that that a lot of the most extreme views and perhaps fascist fascist views are very much tied up with nationalism and which, which perhaps wouldn't happen if you had this confederated system. People would be more humble in their, and, and, and neighborly in their, in their views. And, they, and perhaps we wouldn't need to develop so many sophisticated views about things and which would create less division, I don't know, but, um, but that's a sort of a long way in the future potential kind of. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the word confederation because I think I mentioned it briefly, but this is really, you know, Bookchin's vision was not of, you know, local self-sufficiency or autarky. It was a deeply interconnected uh, democratic confederation of different communities, yeah. um, where instead of those being arranged hierarchically, where the feds dominate the local, that, uh, you know, there's concentric circles of decision making, the, the closer to the base, the more input you have, uh, you know, you send recallable delegates, and it's really a lot of coordination and administration. He didn't write exhaustively on what the, the dynamics of confederalism would actually look like. So yeah. I think that's something that, you know, is, is also maybe shared with Marx in terms of not overly describing in a blueprint form what the good society looks like, right. but rather providing some a, a broad sketch and a framework um, for how we can make decisions. And this is, goes back also to the Paris Commune, that this was already in 1871, uh, a city of a million people, and they broke up into municipal uh, councils that really you know, administrated and made decisions and carried out the business of this large city while also fighting against the forces of reaction. Um, it's, it's quite, you know, there's, there's a reason it's been an inspirational touchstone for most of the left for, for anarchist Marxists and everyone in between. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, social ecology and communalism, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a massively inspiring uh, vision for me and, and a definitely a kind of potentially practical utopia to work towards. But I, I do have still some worries. So, you know, I brought up the potential um, resolving of differences between the left and the right. But on the other side, how would you prevent, even in a confederated system, I mean, possibly the answer is easy. I don't know, because I, I, I'm struggling with it. How would you prevent sort of parochial, very conservative parochial communities from becoming even more reactionary and as they become less, because potentially some communities are, are kind of, um tempered temp at, at the moment tempered by the state so it could become more radical more radically fascist or so how, how would that how would a confederation deal with that kind of thing happening do you think 
Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think on the one hand, yes, the, the kind of forced interdependence of the modern world um, is, a, is an important bulwark against that. And I, th I think you see that a lot. You know, I've lived in Europe for 10 years and you saw a lot of the right taking up the discourse of decentralization and localism against the tyrannical EU that's enforcing, you know, right. feminist gender norms and da, 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 et cetera. And, you know, I, I don't have them on hand. Maybe I could dig them up. But uh, Murray had some great quotes about direct democracy not being a panacea and not being a solve all, um, yeah. you know, a catch all solution that it's an institutional framework for solving some of these problems, okay. but it's also a deeply educational project. So, you know, and this, this really doesn't change much, whether it's the state or whether it's, um, or whether it's, you know, direct democracy, right? Like uh, those problems are still there in either case. So do you want them held back by the repressive arm of the state? Well, maybe in some regards, yes, today we do especially, but uh, the point is that we want this educational process embedded in an institutional arrangement that allows people to argue for their own interests and uh, trying to find a common interest. So I don't think there's a silver bullet to solve problems like this, but I do think this idea of self-determination, uh, which is maybe another way of thinking about direct democracy, um, offers us some tools for getting beyond it. And of course, this is part of a broader project that's, you know, trying to eradicate hierarchy and domination. So, um, and you know, another byproduct I would say is that, you know, the world is getting more and more, more and more diverse. So um, people can advocate for the, their own interests. And in fact, um, the majorities and demographics are shifting quite radically. So, yeah, no, that's a really fantastic response. And, and it, it's made me realize that where that, where my question came from was, I guess, this kind of childish, but it's quite human sort of, um, wish for someone to come along with the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and and that you know that communalism is going to solve absolutely everything, and and that that's the problem that people treat these sort of um, praxis and, and 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 ideas as 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 religions, and that I mean that's been a problem with Marxism, hasn't it? And and any kind of ideology or or system of thought, or or or, or even if it's a more like a pr practical utopian vision it's I guess I don't know whether it's something to do with intellectual laziness in the modern age as well but it's just um we we want someone to give us the whole answer and then and then we can work within that framework and um but yeah thanks you really that was a really good you, you cleared that up um so uh yeah I'd, I'd like to talk about so so in Berlin when you were in Berlin for a couple of years 2015 well, maybe you were there for longer, but 2015, 2016, you taught a course at the Freie Universität Berlin on US social movements from civil rights to Occupy Wall Street. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, talk briefly about, um, as you were teaching that course, did you learn much about, I mean, I'm sure you did, the extent to which the tactics and strategies of um, social movements in America could could also resonated with political organizing in Europe and 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 all, did you did you kind of were you aware of universal principles of organizing coming up or or did you see very much that what you were teaching was a lot of the time quite specific to America? It's a good question um, because I mean it was you know it was there was a lot of people who were politically engaged in the course but it was kind of a survey of the American left like movements and then also some of the theoretical debates so we didn't i mean i'm trying to think because i was also of course like very engaged with the german left at the time okay. um i'm trying to find points of commonality one thing that one thing that really stood out to me um as a as a basic difference is that in most places in europe and certainly in germany it's the left is very organized like people are part of organizations they're not just individuals they don't just show up in when they want at a protest or whatever, it's, it's um, far less cultural and subcultural and more organized. Okay. And as a result, they also have, they have this history, right? So there's connections to different foundations they are connected to parties or institutes, Green Party, Social Democrats and what have you. And so there's a lot more money involved. So, you know, German leftists would fly groups of 50 people to New York to do, um, you know, interviews and a tour of like the, you know, the queer feminist scene in, in Seattle or the Jewish left in New York, which just blew my mind that they had this kind of money that people could take a oh, wow. free field trip for like international solidarity building. And that's in fact how I met um, some of my closest com comrades in Germany. 
Um, yeah, so the money, uh, just the, the level of like organization and the kind of historical memory, the kind of stuff that we're reading, you know, when I was, or I was reading when I was 16, like, you know, Chomsky and some like punk rock stuff or some zines, you know, whereas like the, the my German compatriots were reading Adorno and these very complicated texts. So just, it's, it's, I would say it's a much more theoretically sophisticated um, left as well. Okay. So in terms of like practical stuff, I mean, I think like internationalism, I mean, some of, you know, I met some of these other folks as well through the, the experience of organizing. And, you know, a lot of people went to Europe to, to uh, organize against various demonstrations there and met these people. And, you know, there's a lot of shared politics, a lot of shared tactics and strategies. But I think the thing that was really lacking was a sen the sense of the need for an international organization based on a shared politics. Um, you know, we used to have this in the past. The, the left 100 years ago was better organized and more international than the left today, which is absurd given all the tools we have. Yeah, and of right. course, like I said, the ultra globalization movement or global justice movement that kicked off in North America or in America in 1999 with the Battle of Seattle um, came out of the world social forum experience of, of the 90s, which was, you know, a consciously international um, organization, but it was, it remained fairly, fairly vague and amorphous. It did not have this kind of like focus that I think was in many ways necessary. And I can also contrast this to, you know, like if we want to follow the ebbs and flows of social movements and especially I'll focus, you know, the context I know the best, the US, you know, we see the new anarchist um, shift of the 90s and 2000s. You have the ultra globalization movement and then followed by Occupy Wall Street, which had a lot of the same people. I mean, David Graeber became kind of the de facto voice of Occupy, and he was a co-founder of the Direct Action Network in the 90s that helped organize Seattle. A very much a neo, what I call a neo-anarchist politics of we make the road by walking. He explicitly said, um, you know, anarchism for him is about direct democracy and consensus and, and how you act. It's not about an ideology. It's not about a vision. So it's basically about how you act in the here and now. And I understand there was a lot of appeal to that because it was like this kind of anti-political, modular, low entrance barrier um, form of radical politics. On the other hand, I think it was very limited because you know the things we need to do are not just how we act in the here and now. And they're not just how we make decisions in terms of consensus. It's, it's about a different vision for a good society. It's about a different um, institutional framework for making that happen. So I think that was a little bit um, okay. yeah. naive. So anyway, just to circle back to, to, to DSA, DSA, I think, in many ways, follows out of the kind of collapse of the Occupy movement and some of the limits that it confronted of this direct action, hold space, have encampments, feed people, um, you know, direct action in that regard, that there, there needs to be organization, there needs to be some form of engagement with the state, even though there are wings of DSA that are highly critical of that. Um, and we need to be organized and we need to be accountable. We need to be open to people who don't, you know, have your same subcultural habitus and, and habits and diet and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's not accidental that DSA is now at like 90,000 90, members and, you know, chapters in every state uh, because it's provided that, that kind of institutional vehicle that didn't exist before. And it's a very big tent. You have anarchists, you have Marxists, you have liberals, you have everything in between. So to okay. me, it's kind of a, if you build it, they will come thing that has happened. That's really um, positive. And I push for, you know, a radically democratic politics within it. That's very indebted to social ecology. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'd, I'd like to move on uh, to, to uh, the essay you wrote or article, To Be Realistic, Demand the Impossible, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, and just a couple of points you made in there, well, a few. Um, so could you say, I think you've, possibly already alluded to it, but again, maybe you could explain uh, just slightly more on what you meant by neoliberal ideas have even penetrated radical left movements. In what way have they? Yeah, I mean, so I think I wrote that in 2014 and a couple examples I think that are in there are, you know, um, what was it called? Uh, Occupy, Project Jubilee of Occupy. Now the names are escaping me, but essentially it was a, it grew out of the failure to organize a student loan, a student debt strike where people refused to pay because people were too afraid to do it. And maybe the organization organizing wasn't strong enough. So instead their second move was to organize, basically crowdsource people to buy back debt, um, you know, for cheaper, like using the same derivative markets that caused the crisis in the first place, which I thought was highly ironic. Um, yeah. there, there are other, so I mean, that's just like a very concrete example of kind of a new liberal ideology of like, we're going to individualize, even if it means crowdsourcing, 
um, solutions to the to the problems of capitalism. I mean, I think another one that you know was big in my youth was like this idea of ethical consumption, and you know that was really just like accepted as like a part of radical praxis in the 90s and early 2000s. And then, you know, I think we all saw very clearly how capitalism absorbed that and created things like Whole Foods and yeah. big co-ops and the idea of ethical consumption was taken up very vehemently by um, capitalism and that we're going to channel your desires for a better world back into consumption and ethical consumption. And I think there's deeper ones too. I mean, my dissertation um, talks a lot about this, but some of the very ideas of you know, self-management and autonomy were taken from the libertarian socialist left in some ways. There's a great book called the New, uh, what's it called, the New Spirit of Capitalism by Luke Boltonsky and Eve Chiapello, and they look at how even like the most radical um, street forces of the 1960s in France got integrated into Francois Mitterrand's uh, socialist government and basically instigated neoliberalism there by yeah. saying, you know, here's self-management. We're gonna we're going to uh, grant your desires for more empowerment, for more freeing your, your labor, et cetera, which, you know, took this very perverse form under neoliberalism, which they didn't necessarily see coming. So this idea of, again, decentralization of, um, you know, without worker control, of course, um, some, there's some resonances here. Yeah, okay. Um, critique of the state, another one, you know, like to take another one from Occupy Sandy, you know, they're, they're, they had the slogan of we got this, that they were basically going to do direct action mutual aid of meeting people's needs who had been flooded and forced out of their homes. Um, and they, they were gonna do this somehow instead of the states, even though they of course had very few resources, um, you know, a lot of limitations. So I think there's a danger there that, you know, there's uh, the left often assumes prefigurative politics is going to show a better way, but in this way, I think it could even you know, become an apology for the way things are and say, well, we're just going to solve our problems ourselves and let the state and let, uh, you know, capitalism off the hook. Right, right, right. No, that's that's really well explained. Yeah, thank you. Um, OK, so, yeah, focusing on Occupy, focusing down on Occupy again a bit more. Um, so this is the Occupy movement that started in the US in 2011. And you also have the related in, Indignados, I don't know how you say it, Indignados movement of Spain, around the same time. So you wrote in, in, in this same essay article that um, these movements failed to create a coherent opposition to neoliberalism. Um, now, uh, I, yeah, why do you think, what, why in general terms did that opposition fail? If that's not too broad a question. No, it's, I mean, it's a great question and it's the perennial question, I guess, for the left. Why, why, do, we, why do we keep failing? And uh, it's, it's not a simple one, but I, I will say that I think a big part of the answer for me, um, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of analysis of the altered globalization movement, which is a little bit earlier, focused on 9-11 and that the kind of like war on terror just kind of immediately killed the altered globalization movement. I think that's actually wrong because I think that the movement was already in decline before that. It was already kind of like going through the motions of, you know, mass actions and protests that weren't having the same success of catching capital off guard and actually shutting down these meetings. So to me, this kind of illustrates the limits of David Graeber's kind of um, uh, prefigurative politics where, you know, we just make the road by walking, that it's that anarchism is pure form, it's, there's no content there. And I think you can see this going back to the 60s as well with Students for a Democratic Society uh, in the United States, they talked a lot about participatory democracy, the same way we talked in the 90s about, about direct democracy, but we didn't articulate a very coherent alternative institutional framework. And I think that's what, what communalism or libertarian municipalism, what uh, Bookchin's ideas uh, do. And to go back to the indignados, I think that was another lesson of um, you know, there, I think it's not accidental that they have gone, there's, very, there's a very strong group um, called Barcelona and Camus, Barcelona in Common, that has, you know, it's a lot of indignados veterans who have taken those impulses and built it into a right to the city politics that uses the locality of the city as a stage to basically spotlight who do cities work for and who do they not work for, to basically spotlight class struggles, uh, gender struggles, etc. So I think that um, a lot of movements have come, there's been a convergence um, towards uh, kind of libertarian misplus or communalist, whatever you want to call it, politics. And I find that incredibly heartening. And, you know, even someone like David Harvey, who wrote, you know, he's a geographer and he wrote the book Rebel Cities. 
you know, he wrote very fondly of Bookchin's uh, work in his last few books. And there's kind of a convergence there as well, that there's, there's a shared politics that I think is um, really hopeful. Okay, fantastic. So, so you've talked about the potential um, shortcomings of um, Graeber's approach and, and um, perhaps a lack of organization that, that, that was responsible for Occupy not succeeding. But I'd also now like to talk about the, the idea of leadership, and, um, which is related, obviously. Um, and I'd just like to read a quote from, it, it's the, the Future of the Left, the last essay in the collection that you co-edited, The Next Revolution. Um, so this is from Bookchin um, in, is it early 2000, 2000s, 2002? Um, so he wrote, and you alluded to this earlier, actually, um, few, few uprisings expand beyond the limits of a riot without the guidance of a knowledgeable leadership. The myth of a purely spontaneous revolution can be dispatched by a careful study of past uprisings. And then, he, and then he, he then mentions that he did that himself in his own four volume history, The Third Revolution. And then he writes, even in self-consciously libertarian organizations, leadership always existed in the form of influential militants and in inverted commas, spirited men and women who constituted the nuclei around which crowds transformed street protests into <laughs> outright insurrections. And then I'd also like, like to read a quote from your essay, which relates, instead of, uh, and you're referring to what you, you're calling for new leftist organizations, instead of rigidly denying leadership, such organizations must be ready to facilitate uneven levels of commitment and skill while remaining open, democratic, and cultivating an empowered and energized base. So, yeah, I think those two quotes kind of support each other. And, and, and I get frustrated amongst, because I have some kind of more anarchist friends who seem to be phobic about leadership, or they seem to, to not want to use the word. I mean, that's fine to not want to, if you want to use the word facilitator or coordinator or whatever. But you, in my view, you always need people to initiate things. Right. And, in a, and in a sense, they are lead. They are kind of leading in a sense. But right. so, I, yeah, if you could share some thoughts on, on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with Murray in the need for political leadership. Uh, we might just call it, you know, organizers or organizations. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, you know, there's the problem on the one hand of the, you know, the vanguardism of Leninism that we obviously don't want. And then there's the problem on the other hand of like the denial of power and the denial of organization and some anarchist movements. And there's, I would recommend a great book, uh, article called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which was about the feminist movement, yeah, in the seventies. And how, you know, in even in mov movements that like strenuously denied leadership, there was leadership. It just yeah. by, make, by making it uh, informal and by like not having, you know, formal, decision making and positions, it made it harder to actually root it out and made it even more invisible. And I, I've right. seen this over and over again, okay. which is why I really like, you know, uh, making those making those roles explicit, because as you you read my quote, people do have um, di wildly differential, um, you know, amounts of energy and time. Yeah. And I think movements need to be able, and organizations need to be able to plug people in. They want to devote their life to the cause. Great. If you have an hour a week, great. You know, it's about deciding how to best plug people in and you know becoming like water flowing with that it doesn't mean yeah. calling all the shots or whatever yeah i think that's um that's really important um because people get burnt out and you see this all the time with like the, the diehard mm -hmm. activists and this was myself at many times in, in history uh you just get burnt out by taking it all on even you know in ostensibly democratic movements that are trying to disperse it people often don't want to or can't step up to do those things because they have work they have child care they have etc we, we live in capitalism our time and energy is limited yeah, so yeah i think organization is a way of like addressing that realistically yeah yeah and 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 and, and it's even a response it's even a duty isn't it of 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 you know if we if we have more privilege uh, i in terms of time then then it's almost a duty for us to organize um in a way that then gives people with less privilege more time to, to right. then, yeah. And, and we have to organize that in a way so it remains democratic so that you are respond, you know, whoever is charged with, it, you know, carrying out decisions that have been, you know, we, this is the prefigurative component. 
we will carry out decisions made by the organization the same way that you know confederal delegates are going to coordinate with other communities and other places to carry out the will of people of the people that has come from the bottom up but now it just has to be you know carried out and administered as we're not making the decisions you know bookshare and social ecology make a strong distinction between policy making which is you know in uh, very fiercely democratic and then uh, administration it's just carrying out those things and that doesn't have to be you know micromanaged yeah 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 um, so you also make a call in this essay for new leftist organizations um, building alliances between different leftist organizations both activist and intellectual uh, groups coming together um, and I wanted if you wanted to give some more thoughts on um, and I, I just wanted to bring in a, 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 an example from today. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be uploading this to YouTube and I was just searching. Obviously, YouTube is a, is a corporate platform, where, but, you know, arguably it can be used subversively in a small way. Um, I was just searching today for activists from different countries. Like one of them in particular was Myanmar because I've been interviewing people as part of the civil disobedience movement there. And I was noticing how these, so some of these young Myanmar people were starting out with these YouTube channels saying, please help us and, and we want support for the revolution in Myanmar. And I, it just struck me how, you know, it's great what they're doing, but there's so many different people on, on different channels. And, and then I was looking at organizations who have YouTube channels and how even organizations who have the, st the same stated intents and even goals, even ideologies are kind of competing for attention almost, maybe not aggressively, but they are competing for attention. And then sure. I was just, and it's not just on YouTube. And then I was thinking about how leftist organizations in general are kind of often, even without realizing they're doing it, competing for attention, competing for membership. Yeah. And how can we, create broad coalitions and organizations where we're not just loose alliances you know on, on, a, on a piece of paper but where, where we actually co-strategize and we actually develop co-strategies and, and develop some kind of meta strategy and how can we get beyond and, and then I was reflecting on how and YouTube is a good example but it's not just YouTube it's the whole of society how neoliberalism has has divided us and divided our movements and, and how can we get over that? And have you got any thoughts on how can we, you know, it's, it's even on a level of physics, I, I kind of have this vision sometimes of all these different groups. They've got all these different aims and they're just sort of banging against each other. And it's, it's, it's so, it's such a waste of energy. I, I, I just kind of don't understand why there's such a waste of, it's like a wasted opposition almost, mm. it seems sometimes. I mean, there's, yeah, just two quotes that illustrate that. I mean, one is that, quote slash meme that the right looks for converts and the left looks for traitors and the kind of circular right, right. caring okay. quad. Of <laughs> yeah. And the other one is, you know, from your homeland, uh, the, the Monty Python sketch of the oh. Judaic People's Front. People's oh, Front. Oh, yeah, yeah. Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have this intense, like, factionalization uh, on the left, whereas the right tends to try to, like, overlook those. And some of those, you know, differences, like I said, are meaningful and, and, and principled. But on the other some of them are so far away. They're so about such minute details about the good society that it really seems, you know, uh, very theoretical to get too fixated on them because we don't have the kinds of mass movements necessary to put those dreams into action. So, to me, that's one another like, really good experience of the ultra globalization movement and Occupy to some extent was like working together across different groups, different ideologies for like a very concrete goal. Whether that's shutting down this ministerial meeting or you know, feeding people in an encampment, et cetera. Those are both, of course, very, very limited. So, but I think you, know, you have the same dynamic on a larger thing, on a larger scale. And I think this is what a lot of right the city movements have found. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this, for example, with quite a bit of success um, here in Seattle, even though it hasn't been like a conscious campaign by you know, social ecologists or communalists to kind of take over city council, activists have done a very good job of kind of spotlighting the class nature of how Seattle is run and who it's run for. And we had actually Kashama Savant as someone who I organized with a long time ago, you know, when she was part of Socialist Alternative, they were one of the few kind of like actual activist socialist groups that you could really work with and did work. And um, she's done a great job of spotlighting that. 
And same way with like the, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, when they had the Capitol Hill occupied uh, territory, the CHOP, the CHAZ up there. It was really a beautiful example. One day, the one day I was able to go over there um, of direct democracy or communalism in action was there was a citizens, you know, a, a popular assembly happening in the street that was being moderated by a Duwamish tribal elder while uh, Duwamish dancers and singers were kind of performing on the side in front of the abandoned police precinct. And the discussion was, what do we want to do with the money that we will save by defunding the police? What are our priorities as a community? And to me, that was like a really amazing example of like a, a decolonial uh, libertarian municipalist uh, praxis that was very hopeful and that people were really coming to a set of shared um, ideas that were quite radical. And we get this a lot um, with our classes with social ecologies. People say, you know, this is what I've always, people who have never been in the radical left before say, this is what I've always kind of felt and believed. I just never knew that it was out there. So I think yeah. there is like, there's a deep resonance with the idea of a more cooperative, democratic um, world that social ecology wants to create. So yeah. I think that, um, you know, we have the power of ideas and we have the power of numbers. There's more of us than them. So uh, that's why I think, you know, Murray really emphasized democracy as a, as a, a powerful force in, you know, the kind of democratic ecological class struggle that we have to wage to make this world livable for human beings, for the majority of people on this planet and for the earth itself. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a really inspiring example. Um, but I guess, I guess my response is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of coalition building is more apt to happen on a local level and, and that's fantastic in, in in context but but also don't we need a kind of well I mean yeah you've already you've already referred to it we all we also need don't we we also need I mean we've got the underlying theory of, of social ecology and, and complementary approaches and theories but we also need to build an international organization maybe it's not the time for that yet but surely we need some kind of international I mean, there are international organizations, but we need more international solidarity, like, like you've already said, I think. Um, and maybe things just haven't got bad enough yet for that to happen. I don't know or what, what the reason is, but um, I mean, I was going to ask you next more about the ISC and your role as, as director and um, what role do you see the ISC have, having moving forward in, in, in helping to sort of make these links? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the Institute has always played since it was founded in 1974, an important role in offering a place to think through the theoretical and practical questions of people struggling for a good society. So, you know, 70s were obviously kind of the aftermath of the new left and the kind of new social movements of the 70s and 80s that were trying to put together a new kind of synthetic politics that was feminist, environmental, anti-capitalist, radically, radically democratic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it provides a pretty unique space to think about this whole history of you know, left organizing that, that has failed in so many spectacular ways right up until the present. To reflect on that, to meet with like-minded people who are thinking about those problems and to try to offer some tools for both thinking forward and organizing forward um, to, to, to work our way out of this, this situation. So yeah, I mean, we, we do a bunch of different classes. Our Ecology Democracy Utopia course that I believe you took is kind of a, a broad um, topical overview that looks at the state, it looks at capitalism, it looks at nature philosophy, it looks at organizing, um, it looks at reconstructive vision. We have a new class that's starting very soon that's taught by Hyatt Heller called The Politics and Philosophy of Social Ecology, which oh, is a little bit yeah. focused, focused on specifically like social ecology's nature philosophy and how this directly leads to this kind of radically democratic politics. We offer courses on the Frankfurt School critical theory, which is an important kind of background set of ideas for social ecology. Um, very, you know, dissident and orthodox Marxist thinkers that were writing in America in the aftermath of uh, the Holocaust. We have a new class during the spring called Food and Climate Justice by two longtime activists and, and, act, and academics in that field, because obviously these have become central um, nodes in our movements around yeah. food sovereignty, food justice, and climate justice. Um, and so social ecology has played a role in all of these movements. And really the Institute is a place to kind of reflect on movement practice, to bring activists and academics into conversation with each other, to, to force activists to think more historically and theoretically, and to, to force academics to think more practically in terms of practice. So I think in that regard, it's a, it's a really unique and important um, 
place that, that offers something that's um yeah isn't really offered anywhere else i would say that i've come across okay right yeah i mean yeah uh, i i absolutely loved the the intro course and it was so rich and it sent me off in so many different directions of research and um yeah i'm on Chaya's course and i hope to do a food-based one as well if i can find the time but um also one of your um competencies you're one, one of the things you list as a teaching competency comp, comp, sorry competency is intersectionality um and i wonder if you've got much to say about the concept or, or the practice of intersectionality moving forward in the isc and like perhaps in respect to um do, or do, do you ever bring in guest guest speakers or I mean I've only done the intro course I don't know but perhaps from more diverse you know a, a diversity of communities a diversity of backgrounds or have you oh, certainly I mean yeah. yeah I mean the ISC when it was first found in the 70s you know a big chunk of it was this experiential project in the Lower East Side um, predominantly Puerto Rican neighborhood where we put in some of the first solar panels in America did you know aquaculture fish farms in the basements um, did Gar rooftop gardens, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we've worked with you know various indigenous groups on tribal sovereignty, okay. environmental justice movement, et cetera. So that's that's this kind of intersectional analysis of environmental and social problems is in fact central to social ecology. Yeah. It's kind of forgotten today because you know it's just kind of taken for granted. But Bookchin's critique of hierarchy and domination was explicitly a critique of the kind of economic reductionism of Marxism that really only looked you know at class inequality and left out all these other things. Um, so yeah, and also our, our, I forgot to mention, we do summer intensives every June and until COVID happened, we would do this in different locations. So last time we did one in person, um, we did it up in Vancouver, BC and we tapped into local groups there. We did a, a panel on indigenous sovereignty and decoloniality. Um, it was really fantastic. When we were down in San Francisco, we met with folks from Green Action. It's a largely African-American uh, group and community fighting against environmental racism in the Bay Area. So yeah, of course, um, our movements, our, our classes, et cetera, are, are intersectional in nature because the nature of our problems are intersectional. And I'm gonna actually have an article coming out this summer in our, our journal Harbinger that looks at um, this kind of forgotten history, I guess, of social ecology um, as being a forerunner to environmental justice movements and okay. kind of analyzes what Bookchin said and didn't say about race, colonialism, and uh, identity. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll be really interested to read that. Um, I'm just I'm just looking at the time and and I I, I think I've got about another eight minutes so um, I, so I really enjoyed uh, interviewing Kaya Heller recently who's also a faculty member of the ISE and one of the questions I asked her um, was around her her praxis of illustrative opposition which I thought was a really good interpretation of um, or one way of approaching sort of action towards towards a social ecological society one of the one of the questions i asked her about it was was it only applicable to liberal democracies and not really um not really applicable to, to situations of extreme oppression and hardship and she came back at me with this thing about rojava and she said no actually what they're doing in rojava is kind of illustrative opposition so it's so, so she kind of made me realize that, that yeah, my, my kind of assumption was completely wrong on that. So now I'm going to ask you like the opposite question, okay. which is not, not, not specifically about um, Chaya's sort of interpretation, but um, in terms of communalism in general, is it something that can only be achieved under conditions of extreme oppression, such as in Rojava? Um, is it in a liberal democracy could we ever see uh, a communalist um, society develop at any pace or is it going to take extreme uh, kind of military uh, oppression and so on? I mean, I'm thinking of Myanmar at the moment. I've been interviewing some of the people from Myanmar and, and mm -hmm. there, are, there are kind of three main opposition groups as part of the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar. And one of those opposition groups, which isn't the one that's associated with the uh, elected MPs of the 2020 so-called democratic election, which actually excluded ethnic minorities. So one of the opposition groups is known as the General Assembly of the Nationalities, and that's seen as the most progressive, 
because they're ethnically diverse and they want some mm. kind they want some kind of confederation uh, um, of Myanmar, but I don't think they've gone as far as saying they don't want a state at all. You know, they haven't gone that far. But but it did strike me that the most radical wing of the civil disobedience movement wants they they want a confederation of sorts, and it and it got me to thinking of is it only in these really extreme? Are, are, can we only get absolute justice after we've had after we've had absolute oppression? I guess is another sort of simplistic way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky question. And I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, when I was rereading the last chapter of the future of the left of the next revolution, you know, he talks a little bit about, um, yeah, you know, historically revolutions happening in moments of big change or a power vacuum or powers lying in the street. I mean, earlier you mentioned, I, f I forget, I want to make a point, but about the Arab Spring, I guess it's about organization and leadership. You know, the Arab Spring did a good job of toppling um, you know, various regimes and especially in Egypt, but who was it that filled that power vacuum? The Muslim Brotherhood, who were the most well-organized right, right. on the ground. Yeah. So um, I think obviously like those moments of kind of collapse and power vacuum are important, but I don't think they're the only ones. I think we can also build, you know, nodes of dual power in the here and now that are, you know, eroding the power of the state, eroding the power of capital. And I, I take a very like um, pluralistic view on this, you know, in terms of like, you know, working, uh, fastidiously outside of the state or people working within it to extract reforms that then lead the ground, lay the groundwork for further reforms. I think uh, we need to take a both and approach to this as long as we keep those limits, the possibilities and limits of any strategic orientation in mind. I mean, Bookchin's communalist project, you know, he kind of identified two broad uh, tactical or strategic arenas. One was kind of um, extra parliamentary, you know, call your own popular assembly, organize outside of the state and build intention, um, create a, a legitimate democratic counterpower. And the other, which he tended to kind of prefer later in life, was to enter into local political um, arenas and use its, you know, existing legitimacy and whatnot and uh, form a radical critique to form uh, a, a dual power scenario. And that's obviously going to be a very long, um, arduous path. And I don't think it's really so different if it happens, you know, in the context of like, you know, stable Western democracy, or if it happens in the course of what's happening in Myanmar or other, or Syria, for example, I think there's actually a lot of commonalities there. The, the, the contexts are obviously very, very different, but I think that the overall um, goals and even some of the political modes are really not so different. Yeah, sure. sure. It is, it is ironic that Bookchin, who was like in many ways both lauded and criticized as kind of the pinnacle of utopian thinking, um, you know, Ursula Le Guin, the famed science fiction writer, wrote the foreword to our book. Yeah. Where were these ideas most, you know, concretely put into action in this, you know, seemingly dystopian um, arena of, of uh, northern Syria and Kurdistan? Um, so let a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I did want to... Uh, read another quote from uh, the, the Future of the Left, that final as essay. Um, Burchin writes, uh, my purpose is to suggest that the problems that may well turn most of humanity against capitalism may not necessarily be strictly economic ones or rooted in class issues. And I think there's a lot of hope there that, I mean, because situation is getting so bad with e ecology and in particular the climate crisis of, that we're undermining, you know, the hab hab habitability of Earth um, for our own species, at, at the very least, um, it's becoming inhospitable. Uh, maybe it could be the the the, um, the thing that that drives people towards a more social ecological um, uh, path. Um, and yeah, I, I guess you, you've already. Uh, Given that was quite that was quite a good quote um, that a thousand flowers blue maybe I should just cut off the the video after I mean, that but <laughs> that's that I mean that is opening up a very big can of worms and one that I have some you know significant disagreements with Murray about on like the the general trans class interests versus the, the persistence of class interests which I mean I think it's it's not accidental that later in life he actually wrote much less about environmental problems and I think okay. this reflected some of his um, skepticism that the environmental crisis was going to be this trans class thing, because I think we've already seen there's been 
highly class stratified responses to it. Some people are going to go to the moon. Some people are going to build bunkers. Right, right. Most people are going to, you know, whatever. So I don't think it's turned out to be this like magic bullet that's beyond class. And I think right. connected to that, his later writings are overflowing with praise for Marx and for the left that was, the old left. So I think that he also had some, I don't, I wouldn't say regret, but he saw that there was worse things than the, the old Marxian left that he helped bury. So um, I think that the persistence of class inequality is a hugely important issue and uh, would be really foolish to throw that out. Um, and I think, you know, when you organize on a, on a municipal level, the class differences become very stark and you can actually very easily identify just a, a local example, the landlords that are trying to, you know, do development. And there's like a handful of them and the city council is going along with them. Meanwhile, the whole city, we're in a housing crisis. We can't, people cannot afford housing in so many places. And here's the reason why, and we outnumber them. So here's a democratic anti-capitalist class politics um, happening on the local level. So I don't think we'd want to say, oh, we have a trans class interest with these landlords and, you know, wanting to avert environmental destruction. Well, maybe, but that's very abstract, whereas this is like very direct. So. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, citizen and class can go together. And I think Bookchin understood that later in life too. Okay. Well, that, I think that's a, that's a great practical um, example to end on. Um, so yeah, Blair Taylor, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, thanks for having me. I enjoyed our conversation.